Atomic Theory Lesson 2.1 History of the Atom The Greek philosopher Democritus, who lived between 460 and 370 BCE, before the Common Era, along with his teacher Leucippus, came up with the idea that matter could not be infinitely divided. There had to be a point at which we got to the elementary particle that was not divisible. He called this elementary particle the atom, and he believed atoms were indestructible and not divisible. Atomos is the Greek word meaning uncuttable, indivisible. Democritus believed that atoms were small, hard particles that were all made of the same material, but were different shapes and sizes. Atoms were infinite in number and were always in motion and capable of joining together. Democritus's theory was rejected by Aristotle and Plato, who believed that matter consisted of the four elements earth, air, fire, and water. Since Aristotle and Plato were more popular, their idea was accepted and would take about 2,000 more years before the acceptance of Democritus's atom. John Dalton was an English chemist who came up with the atomic theory. He theorized that all matter is made of tiny indivisible particles called atoms, just as Democritus said. He believed that atoms of the same element were identical and atoms of different elements were different. Atoms of different elements combine in whole number ratios to form compounds. And chemical reactions involve the rearrangement of atoms. No new atoms are created or destroyed. What we mean by whole number ratios, that atoms of different elements combine in whole number ratios to form compounds, can be better explained in an example. For example, two hydrogen atoms and one oxygen atom will form together to make H2O, water. If you notice, the ratio between hydrogen and oxygen in water is 2 to 1. It's a whole number ratio. This is based on the fact that atoms are indivisible, so of course they're going to react in whole number ratios. You're not going to have one hydrogen to half an oxygen because we don't have half atoms. But more than that, these particular whole number ratios, such as 2 to 1, hydrogen to oxygen and water, gives water its identity. And in chemical reactions, atoms are rearranged. They're neither created nor destroyed. So again, in our example, two hydrogen atoms plus one oxygen atom yields water. Notice how hydrogen and oxygen atoms are rearranged to form water but we haven't created any new hydrogen or oxygen atoms, nor have we destroyed any old ones. J.J. Thompson in 1897 discovered the electron, proving that atoms are divisible. There is something smaller than an atom. It's the electron. This was J.J. Thompson's experiment. He had a cathode ray tube, which is a vacuum tube, in which all the air is pumped out and he added some gases to it. He pumped in neutral gases. And there was a voltage source attached to both ends of the cathode ray tube, creating a negative and positive end. When a voltage source is supplied, a beam of gas particles moves from the negative electrode to the positive electrode. When Thomson added an electric field, that's the um, plus and minus sign on both sides of the cathode ray tube, he saw that the gas particles were deflected towards the positive plate. Since opposite charges attract, Thomson deduced that there must be something negative in the gas particles, something negative that attracted it to the positive plate. Thomson called these negative particles corpuscles. Today we call them electrons. Since the gas was neutral, meaning it has no charge, he reasoned that there must also be positively charged particles to balance out the negatively charged corpuscles, but he never was able to find them. Thomson's experiments led him to devise the plum pudding model. He believed the atom consisted of negatively charged corpuscles or electrons embedded in positively charged stuff. I don't eat plum pudding, it's a, probably an English thing, but it's sort of like plums or raisins are the electrons. 
And the stuff, the positive stuff, is the pudding. Ernest Rutherford, in 1909, another English scientist, designed an experiment to determine the size of the atom. What he did is he shot alpha particles, which are positively charged particles given off by uranium, at gold foil made to be only a few atoms thick. He expected the alpha particles to pass right through the gold foil because as the positive charge was spread out evenly throughout the atom, according to the plum pudding model, there wouldn't be enough positive charge in any one part of the atom to stop the alpha particles. Notice how in this image we see alpha particles passing right through an atom of gold. What he got when he shot alpha particles at gold foil was that indeed some of them went straight through the gold foil, but others were deflected. Some deflected a great amount, some even came right back at him. Rutherford was later to say that it was like shooting a bullet at a tissue paper and having the bullet ricochet right back at you. Rutherford theorized that there must be a small, dense center of the atom that contained all of its positive charge, and that the positive alpha particle would be repelled by this positive center when it came into contact with it. Rutherford called this positive center the nucleus. He believed that the atom was not a bunch of positive stuff with negatively charged electrons embedded within it, but rather it was mostly empty space. The nucleus was at its center, a small, dense concentration of positive charge and mass. Alpha particles are deflected by the positively charged nucleus if they get close enough, and the negatively charged electrons were scattered outside the nucleus. In 1913, Robert Millikan devised an apparatus to measure the charge of an electron. What he did is he placed charged oil drops between two high voltage parallel plates here. By adjusting the electric field between the plates to counteract the force due to gravity, the charge of the oil drop could be determined. This is the force diagram of the oil drop. When the electric field counteracted the force due to gravity, he could determine the charge Q of the electron because the electric field force was now equal and opposite to the gravitational force. Niels Bohr, a Danish scientist, further studied the electron. He studied why when hydrogen emitted light, it only emitted some colors and not others. A little background, if you look at white light through a diffraction grating or through water droplets after a rainstorm, you'll see all the colors of the rainbow. But if you look through a diffraction grating at the light given off by hydrogen gas, you only get a few distinct bands of color. Hydrogen only gives off light of a few distinct frequencies or energy. Bohr supposed that these distinct energies described all the possible transitions of hydrogen's one electron. When the electrons absorb energy, they jump to higher energy levels. When they relax back to their ground state, this absorbed energy is released as light. So let's say one electron was in the third energy level. When it moved down to a lower energy level, the second energy level, it would give off a photon of red light. Similarly, if the electron were in n equals 4, the fourth energy level, and moved to the second energy level, it would give off this aqua or turquoise light, which is a greater energy, a higher energy light. And if it moved an even greater distance between n equals 5 and n equals 4, I know it doesn't look like a big distance because this isn't drawn to scale, it would give off this blue light. Bohr developed what has since become known as the electron orbital model because he believed that electrons orbited the nucleus much like planets orbited the sun. He believed that electrons orbited around the nucleus in specific energy levels. Since the distances between the orbits in an atom are not all the same, no two leaps in an atom will have the same energy. 
The closer the orbits are in energy, the lower the energy of the photon emitted. A lower energy photon emits a longer wavelength light. Scientists, however, have since found that Bohr's model is incorrect. We will continue our discussion of the electron in the next video, Quantum Mechanics. James Chadwick, while a prisoner of war in World War I, studied how an atom's mass was greater than its number of protons would lead you to believe. For some reason, an atom containing three protons would weigh as if it contained six protons. He theorized that there must be three other particles in a nucleus that have the similar mass of the three protons. Using some of the data collected by the Curie's radiation experiments, Chadwick was able to prove the existence of a neutron, which is a neutral particle contained within the nucleus with approximately the same mass as a proton. This concludes Lesson 2.1, History of the Atom. Please proceed to Quiz 2.1 before continuing on to the next lesson.